Amen, amen, amen. How many are on the Lord's side? On the Lord's side. That means you have to give up your side. It means you can't have a side. Say it again, it means you can't have a side. Say it again, it means you cannot have a side. There was an angel that came to Joshua. And the angel actually said, I'm not on your side. Neither am I on their side. The angel was representing God. And I just had a conversation and a meeting with some pastors and we was talking about this whole political issue. And it's not about, and we came to the conclusion that every Democrat is not the same. Every Republican ain't the same. Every conservative is not the same, but there's one main thing we all came to conclusion was. We have to submit our Republicanism and democracy and beliefs to one person alone, Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter who's in office. Doesn't matter who's over the nation. The Bible says in Isaiah, God saw God, Isaiah saw God high and lifted up. And it says in the year King Uzziah died. What most people don't really understand about Uzziah, Uzziah was a good king. He was very militaristic, he was intelligent, but he became very arrogant. And through his arrogance, he began to abuse the priesthood. And he tried to operate in a function that was not, he didn't stay in his lane. And God struck him with leprosy. And he was separated from the presence of God. He started off well. But the problem was his own arrogance. And so the Bible tells us to pray for leadership. We ought to pray for those. And so when they had no king, God said, I'm going to show you who's unwavering. Me. It does not matter. If Biden goes another term or not, it does not matter. God still sits on his throne. And sometimes God will put a wicked king to test our hearts. He put somebody you don't like up there. Just to see if you're going to pray for him. Just to see what we're going to do. God will put a Pastor Brandon as the pastor to see how you're going to react to the change God want to do in this church. And so today, um, this is my first time missing a lot of the festivities for the family union that's been down here, but I was, I was working um, for my school, South Florida Bible College and theological seminary. Um, and so in the foyer, there's a table with information about us. And for a long time, my father always instilled into me education. He instilled a lot of things into me. Take care of your body. Take care of your body. Work out. You know. Um, and then education was another thing. But honestly, I ran from that for a while. I, I tried it my way, Antoine's way. Anybody ever tried it your way? Didn't really work out that well. And um, so South Florida, I work for the school. I do church and community engagement with the school, for the school. I'm a representative. And that was a blessing and a gift from God. Um, and so at South Florida Bible College of Theological Seminary, uh, we have a creation studies institute. We teach young people, youth, adolescent, teenager, and adults about creation from a biblical standpoint. So you can have those tools and resources to defend your faith in a system and society that pushes evolution on our kids. 
Um, and then we have a dual enrollment program at our, at our college. We are located here in Deerfield Beach, Florida. Um, so those that are 15 to 18, if you want to go to school three times a week and get your and be able to come out and graduate high school with an associate's degree. Um, and because of our program, we have had students get 30, 40, 50 thousand dollar scholarships to Nova and other universities. Uh, we have national accreditation with um, Association of Biblical Higher Education in Orlando, Florida. Um, and then we have our degree programs. And we go all the way up from associates to a doctorate degree. Um, something my dad always said, work smart, not hard. Work smart, not hard. And my dad and I used to, uh, used to talk about Perry all the time. He said, Antoine, I'm out here sweating. Sweating bullets, making his money. And Perry sits in an office. Make <laughs> <laughs> he sits in the office and making two and three times as much money as me and your mama. And something he instilled, and he didn't just say it about my cousin Perry, but he said it about life. Find a way to do things more effectively. You want to be effective. You want to live effectively. And he always said, I want you better than me. I want you better. And so at South Florida Bible College Theological Seminary, we have degrees that help us become better. Our mission is to train men and women to serve Christ in the church through biblical thought and biblical living. And that's our mission, through, through where the Bible is central. And so we have degrees in business, um, psychology, Christian counseling, ministry leadership, worship, um, counseling. We have a men master's in business administration, a master's in mental health, um, and a doctorate in ministry. And we are among the top most affordable Christian colleges in the nation. I get paid to say that. I get paid to say that. I get paid to do what I've always been doing. But I would have never gotten there if I had never taken the steps to get there. And so I'm 35 years old, and, I, and I, I think now I understand my father more after he died, more than when he was living. Because when I was young, I didn't see what my dad was saying. I really didn't. And I, I even called my uncle. I said, uncle, I'm sorry. I didn't see what y'all was saying in those days. My mother says it. The older generation just, now you start to get it what your parents say it. That wisdom, that knowledge, that understanding but there's a wisdom greater than theirs that I want to talk about. A wisdom greater than theirs. And sometimes we miss it as children. And then I find myself thinking like my dad now. I'll look at a situation and I'm like, okay, I get it. I see why he said it. Because there were things missing in my life that he knew 40, 50 years later, I would need those tools, resources, education, and knowledge, and understanding. And that's what parents are called to do. Parents are those that see from a different lens than their children. Parents tell their children to wash the dishes because they're operating from a different lens. They tell us to fold the clothes because they're operating from a different lens. And so God is depicted in scripture as a parent. You ever told your child something and they didn't listen? And it backfired on them? You'd be like, I told you. But you knew what the consequence was, what was going to happen. The same thing with God. It doesn't change. And so God says, I want you to know my thought. You know, in, in Islam, one thing I learned about Islam is in their belief system, they believe Allah, their God, that he's so high up, you can't really get to know him. And every other religion is almost the same. It's, it's so mysterious, you can't really know the creator. But that's, that's not true when it comes to Jesus Christ. God is never depicted as a God that you can't have, you can't talk with. 
that he will not reveal his heart to you. And so God says in Isaiah 55, 8 through 11, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways. declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth, and making it produce and sprout, and providing seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So will my word or my thoughts be with which goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire. And without succeeding in the purpose for which I sent it. For you will go out with joy and be led in peace. The mountains and the hills will break into shouts of joy before you. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Father, we thank you for this word. Thank you for your word and your thought and your thinking. Lord, have your way in this place with us. In Jesus' name, amen. That water bottle that I just drunk out of started as a thought. The pew you're sitting in started out as a thought. The comb you use to comb your hair started out as a thought. The glasses I'm wearing started out as a thought. And so everything we see in you started from somewhere. The phone you're on while I'm preaching started out as a thought. Facebook you're on, Instagram started out as a thought. And with that thought came a plan and a strategy it came a thought, a strategy, and a plan. And so God says, my thoughts. My way of thinking is so vastly different. I have to compare it to the cement that we sit on to outer space. That's how vastly the gulf is between God's thinking and his concept and his ideas to ours. And so what is a thought? A thought is an idea or a synonym, a concept, notion, or impression, meaning which exists in the mind as a representation, as a something comprehended or a formulation or as a plan. The definition something such as an opinion or belief in the mind. So a representation, meaning I represent South Florida Bible College and Theological Seminary. And so what you will find sometimes, what I have found in others, we are the face of the college. And sometimes people will tell to us, we never knew about y'all. And so we bring the idea and the concept of our mission to other people that know nothing about us. We are the face of the school. We bring the thought of the school to other people that know nothing about us. And so many times, God will reveal his thought through other faces. But sometimes, as human beings, we, we, we falter in this because as James says in chapter 2, verse 9, do not show partiality. The thing with that word partiality, it actually literally means a respect of persons. But its origin means to respect the face. So if I don't like your beard, I might not listen to you. I don't like your dreadlocks. Overlook you. Oh, I don't like the, the pants you're wearing. So I won't, I just overlook you. So he says it's actually a sin to judge superficially. To judge superficially. 
Sometimes we think people that might wear a suit might have more value than a person with some jeans on, but you can't show partiality because God may reveal his thought through the person with the jeans on. And the person with the suit on might have the thought of the devil in them. So God said, my thought is it your thought. Your way of thinking don't line up with mine. And so we can miss the mind of God for our lives because we're so caught up in the physical and, it, and the representation don't look right. And, and let's be honest, some of us don't want to come to church, didn't want to come to church today because we had a misrepresentation of God in the church. That's fine. But God says, don't, don't look at the misrepresentation. I'll represent myself. How are you representing himself? Through Jesus Christ, perfectly. So when we misrepresent him, he perfectly represents himself all the time. So if the church fails, Christ doesn't. If you don't get love from the missionary, you always can get love from God. People are going to fail you. We all will fail each other. We all will disappoint each other. And so what are ways? Ways in its Hebraic meaning was basically a path, but it's not a road like we think. And so when I was walking to the beach and I was going to go up a ramp and I didn't know which, how to get up there, I saw this path that was trodden on by other people that went ahead of me throughout this time period. So that's actually what that word means. It means ways or road. God has already gone before us. Sometimes we don't know where to go. We don't even know how to get to the destination. We don't know how to get there. But God says, I, my presence, will go before you. And, 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 and God, what God would do, he will connect us with people that have already been there. And done that. And give us wisdom. Say, don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. Go this way. Because they've already walked the path. And if we ignore people, that have been on the path, you'll find yourself going in circles all your life, wondering why things don't work, wondering why relationships don't work. You know your mom saw that boy from a far off, and that girl told you not to marry him, told you not to hook up with him, but we didn't listen. They had already walked that path. And so God was talking to you, to your mom and your dad, but you thought mom and dad was being mean. Or they didn't want you to have no fun. Not the case. Protection. To save you heartache, save you pain. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. The way I do things. So what do what does it mean? Sometimes when God speaks, it it, it everything we believe. Conflicts. And so God's word comes in the form of a seed. Seeds must be planted and watered. A seed is an embryo of plants. It's full of potential, but it is arrested in development. That's what a dictionary said. Do you know what arrested development is? Psychologically, arrested development, when I was going through therapy years ago, my therapist, psychologist told me, Antoine, you have arrested development. Arrested development is basically something happened when you were five. You never dealt with it. You suppressed it. But you kept growing biologically. 
You never healed. You never forgave. You never let it go. And so part of your brain is still stuck or your mindset is still stuck at five. But now you're 20. But now we, you see you respond like the five-year-old when somebody don't call you or, or you pick up the phone. You respond according to the five-year-old, not the 20-year-old. That's basically how it, how it looks. And so you can be 60 and 70 and 80 and 90 with arrested development. That's why some of us are not changing. We're, we're, we're still responding to situations like the 10 year old. Because we never dealt with that emotion at that time. And until we deal with, watch this, the seed. The seed, the beginning of that thing, it will hinder, watch this, God's manifested desire for our lives. Thank you. And so Jesus talks about seeds. God's talking about seeds. God says, my thought is a seed in the earth. And Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like seeds. And Jesus says that in Mark 7 and 13, thereby invalidating the word or the thoughts of God by your belief or your tradition that you have passed down, you do many things like this. So what are we doing to nullify progress? God says, it ain't, my, it ain't me. Because it ain't me. I, I got the thought. The thought is perfect. The seed is perfect. Seed is not the problem. The seed is not the problem. Something wrong with the earth. There's a misalignment. What's not working in your life that God wants to fix? God says, my word is perfect. Jesus said, there's nothing wrong with the seed. He says, one, the, the, the earth or the ground that goes into it is hard. What makes God's word and thinking ineffective in our lives is some of us are just callous. We're hard-hearted. We don't want to budge. We don't want to let nothing go. Sometimes that hardness is unforgiveness in us that we've been carrying for 15 years. And we see this dysfunctional cycle. Because God says, see, that's the place I want to tap into. I want to break that off of your life. So I can bring the seed of my thought so it can actually grow. So it can grow. The seed form is completely different from the plant. It's plant form. It has fully developed. And when it develops, it produces what? Fruit. Some of us have a seed from God, but we don't see the fruit of what God said in our lives because it's not the seed. It's the heart. It's our heart. What has God promised you that you don't see coming to fruition? Think about it. Just take a few thoughts in and God, you don't promise me some stuff. You don't say it in your word, but I don't never see it. And so in 2021, before the new year came in, I asked the Lord a question. And so when you're going to ask God a question, you better be ready for the answer. And um, I say, God, why aren't things happening? I, I, I don't get this. This don't, this don't make sense to me. And I sat down, I laid down, and I saw, I saw a fence. So I'm seeing this vision. And I saw a cow, but it was extremely emaciated, skinny, looked like it hadn't eaten, was sick, it was dying, it was deformed, it was stuck to this fence. 
And I saw another cow that was healthy stuck to the nipple of the dysfunctional cow trying to get loose. And I came out of the vision. And I didn't know what it meant. I was like, what in the world did I just see? It took me some time to understand it. And God was saying that was traditions you were stuck to. Those are ideas and belief systems you are stuck to that's hindering what I want to do in your life, Antoine. And until you unhinge and let go of some stuff that's dysfunctional, That, that sacred cow, someone's got this sacred cow, we won't buzz for nothing. God wants you to paint the living room blue and you got to keep it red. Why do you have to keep it red? God said, I want to change some stuff. How can I bring you into my promise? If you are holding on to dysfunctional ideologies, I was stuck. Arrested. Development at the age of 33, 32, 25. How many of us get going through that? This is not something to beat ourselves up about. It's something we have to work on. And some of us really, 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 really need to get some therapy. Bad. Bad. Because sometimes... Preaching is part of God's healing process for you. But God, some of us want us to sit in the chair. Therapy has been such a blessing in my life. I still get it once a month. For maintenance. I get it once a month. My therapist told me, uh, when I first met her, I wrote my book four years ago, 2022, my book is called My Bondage and My Freedom from the Mental Institution to the Pulpit. What I learned is a lot of schizophrenia is really just the result of trauma. It's just stuff people don't know how to deal with. And I sat in that sixth floor. A lot of people just don't know how to deal with this stuff. And we spaz out. And we give up. And we quit. And so what she told me when she first met me, Dr. Sandra, um, Antoine, she did this diagnosis assessment of my mind, my emotions. She said, Antoine, you have an anxiety attachment. I said, what is an anxiety attachment? She says, because of your upbringing and your experiences, you have a tendency to misinterpret information or be extremely anxious, be anxious. And it causes you to not trust people. And it causes all the other little symptoms. I'm like, really? Then it causes you how it, it affects how you view God. I was at a time, I was like, after I wrote my book, I'm like, God, do you hear me? Do you care about me? That was part of my way, my thinking. But that wasn't God's thought. I was filtering God through. And until we fix the filter, we had a filter at our home and it broke. And the filter purifies. Filter purifies. But when it got broke, it stopped purifying. So what you think coming out the water? It wasn't clean. I couldn't drink it anymore. But when I put a new one in there, it was now drinkable. Some of us, God is really trying to fix the filter. You don't need a new refrigerator. You just need a new filter system. And until I fix my filter, I saw God completely different. I stopped having this victim mindset. <clears throat> and so one thing that I knew, and I said I did the assessment again this year, and it came out I now have a balanced perspective. That took four years. That's called a process. And I, and I can't stop just because I'm balanced because I still have little tendencies to be anxious and misinterpret information. 
Pro- going through the process doesn't mean you've, you've arrived. Just you've overcome some stuff. And you can better manage your mind and your life and all those things. And that's what God wants. He wants us to be healthy. The Bible says in the Old Testament, to they that are pure, he is perceived as pure. To they that are corrupt, he is perceived as shrewd and mean. And what he's saying is, who you are as a person pr- reflects how you see God. And so if you see God as this lightning bolt from heaven, you got a wrong perception of God. If you see God as if he don't care about you, that's the wrong thought. God says, that is not my thought. That thought came from somewhere else. The thought came from somewhere else. And so I had to change my thought process. And I still have to change it every single day for the next 50 years until I die. It takes work to change the mind. It takes work. But it's worth it if we're willing to do it. If we are willing to do it. Question is, are we willing to acknowledge God's thought and our thought that they're vastly different and willing to change our thought to be in alignment with his. So Jesus says, my thoughts ain't your thoughts. My ways ain't your ways. So to invalidate means to destroy or to weaken, to counteract effectiveness, to cancel out something. And so Jesus is saying, you have canceled the word of God. You have canceled God's thought for you and others because of how you think. That's a powerful statement. And and I'm saying all this not for the sake of condemnation, but for conviction. Conviction. God can't change us if we we don't convict us. And when he convicts us, there's a purpose. There's some work he wants to do. There's some more work he wants to do in us. I'm going to say this. What also helped me to become balanced was forgiving my dad. My dad's been dead. Well, his body's been dead. He's with the Lord. Uh, he sleep, as the Bible says. When my dad died, I didn't know I had unforgiveness against him. Unforgiveness actually nullifies prayer in the scriptures. It hinders prayer. God had to deal with me on so many levels with my daddy. And it wasn't until I realized, and I said this to myself, you know what? My dad could only do what he could do. And I stopped putting my dad on this pedestal of what a super dad supposed to be. Some of us have the expectation of our parents and people and church, and it hurt us, and they didn't meet the expectation. And we're harboring that, and that is that one little thing God is trying to deal with that's hindering the prayer. That was the main thing that changed my anxiety from my attachment from anxiety to a wholeness. And my therapist told me, Antoine, you got a lot of dad pain. And if some of us have, if we don't get real with ourselves, we're going to rock around mad at the church when it wasn't ever the church. It wasn't even God. It was your auntie, uncle, cousin. Something happened in your life that distorted our view of God and the things he has for us. And until we forgive and process that stuff, 
properly, we're going to keep canceling God's thought. So how do we how do we get God's thought? One, ask. God, what is your thought? Tell me. I want to know. What is your thought pertaining to the relationship I'm in? What is your thought for my children? What is your plan? What is your thought and plan for this church? See, when we ask, you gotta be ready to throw out stuff. Because God, when he answers, I'm telling you, he's going to challenge your thinking. God may say, get hope, rid of all them, them pews right there. Get rid of them pews, get rid of all that, and um, I want to do something different. When, God, when you ask God of his thought, he's going to tell you. So just be ready. Ask. Ask God what he thinks about your life. Ask God what he thinks about your purpose, your relationship. Everything you want to know, just ask them. The Bible says, ask, and it shall be what? Given. Seek, and you shall knock, and the door will what? Hold on, that's in the word? Oh, so God was revealing his thought. Oh, we're talking about thoughts, his thinking. So God said, oh, you don't have stuff because you ain't even asked me for it. You don't have it because you didn't seek me for it. The door ain't open because you ain't never knock. Well, when we don't, when we are two, the truth, second thing is you can't know God's thoughts if you're not in the scripture, not in the word. Not in the word. How can I know the mind of God for my life and everything else if I'm ignorant and oblivious? to his mind that he has already revealed. He's already revealed. He's already revealed. Psalms 119 verse 105 says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. I don't think none of y'all would have came in this church if all these lights was off. Y'all would have walked up in here and walked right back out. Oh, they ain't got church today. I don't think nobody just gonna sit in a dark room. Would y'all? No, y'all wouldn't. Might go to sleep. <laughs> Take your nap. What happens when your tail lights and your 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 lights off and your car? The police pull you over. Light plays a great part in our lives. God says, "My word." will illuminate your life. It'll show you all the dark blind spots. Ever had blind spots? See, my, my dad told me how to drive. He told me about blind spots. You can't just look in the river mirror. You got to look over. Because this stuff, you don't see in that river mirror. You see in that blind spot. You didn't see, we'll see it was there. God's word will illuminate the blind spots. And some of us keep hitting stuff. And keep hitting stuff because we are not in his word. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit. John 16, 13. Jesus said, I'm sending my comforter. The word comforter means, literally means somebody that actually comes beside you literally to help you. Literally. But it's got another word in there. It's called kaleo. It means to call. Meaning, if you're doing something, and I come to help you, and I want to help you, but you'll never ask for help, you ain't going to never get the help. Y'all got somebody on your phone? If something happened, you know you could call them. They'll bail you out, give you some money, talk. Jesus says the Holy Spirit operates the same way. You can't just, you can have it in your phone. But if I don't call, I can't get the help I need. We got folks saved. You can give your life to Jesus, be born again and sealed with the Holy Spirit and, and have them 
in you, but you ain't calling on them. That's what the word means. To call on assistance. And so I found throughout my life, the more I ask for his help, the more he helped me. But the more I don't ask for his help, he don't help me. The Holy Spirit wants us to be dependent on him. So he wants us on the favorite five. He wants to be on our favorite five, like back in the day. You know, you had your favorite five. The speed dial. Holy Spirit wants to be on speed dial. Fourthly, community. God will reveal his thoughts through other people to us. Acts 13, 1 through 3 talks about prophets and teachers being in assemblies like this. Just gathering. The word church really means to gather. People. It's people. It's communal. Meaning you can't be by yourself. You are not called. God did not call us to be isolated. He didn't call us to be isolated. And so what God does in that scripture, he says, set aside. The Holy Spirit talks. The Holy Spirit is audible. He will talk. The Bible says they were fasting and praying. And they spoke and said, set aside Paul and Barnabas and send them on the mission. Sometimes God will give you a word about your life and give you direction when you connect with other believers and people. Sometimes God ain't going to always talk to you. He want to talk to you through somebody else. But if we're isolated, see, the enemy fights the gathering. He don't want nobody to get together. He don't want your family to get together. Because you sharpen each other. You better each other. You bless each other. And so what I may be struggling with, my strength can come from you. My help can come from you. And so the greatest hindrance to the church is not the gathering is in the separation. And so if Satan can scatter us and make me not like you. Now the word that God gave you to give me, you won't give it. And that word was supposed to help me, but now I can't get the help because you got to all with me. Fifth, dreams and visions. This is not really taught a lot. Dreams and visions. So how did I end up at South Florida Bible College? Ask me how. Long story. Thank you for asking. So I had a dream. I was at Jesus People Proclaim with Apostle Billy and Cynthia. And I had this dream. My, one of my mentors was in the dream. And I mentioned South Florida Bible College that I had always wanted to go. And honestly, I was fighting it. Like, Let me think about it. Let me think about going. And then I had another dream about the school. And the president, Dr. Mary, and then my, my division chair and mentor, Dr. Rackley, were in the dream. And I'm supposed to go again. So, okay, okay, let me pay attention. Let me. And what dreams will do, what God does in a dream, he bypasses your intellectual mind. He bypasses your intellectual mind to speak to you. Because while we awake, we'll push God back. Our intellect will push God back every time. So God will wait till we go to sleep. He'll wait till we go to sleep and show you something and give you direction. A vision is not a dream. A vision is when your intellect, God can trust your intellectual mind to submit to him. So now he can show you an image or, or, or a dream while you're asleep. So perfect example was at um, Social Security years ago with my mom. She had a van. And I'm sitting up in the Social Security office, and all of a sudden, I see this, this movie. It's basically going to come, come like a movie of people want to break into the, the van. I shrugged that up. I'm like, no, I think I'm just tripping. No. -uh. By the time we got out, Social Security went to the, the van. They actually tried to break in the van. That is two ways God can speak to you. God can speak through a thought. He can speak through an idea. And you have to be sensitive. 
You have to be sensitive. Another way God speaks is restlessness or frustration. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, the Bible says, an open door was given to Paul, and uh, he, he was there, he went doing the mission of God, and the Bible says he had a restless spirit. He didn't have no rest, he had no peace, and he left. Sometimes God will make you frustrated to make you make a decision. God says, I'm revealing my thought, your season is up, your time is up here, or I don't want you around them. God will make you not like people, kind of. <laughs> He'll kind of make you not like them. Like, just a little something. I don't know what it is at the bottom, but they just my spirit. Restless. I can't. Now, we, we ain't going to be able to go out at night. I just, <laughs> you ain't going to have no peace. Bible actually says, Timothy was not in Troas. Some people bring peace in your life. Other people make your spirit restless. Sometimes that's God talking, you might need to leave. You might need to relocate. You might need to separate. God will allow things to agitate you, and he's letting you know right here in your spirit, no, I don't do that. I think God will speak to your heart. Nehemiah 2, 12. Nehemiah says, I did not tell anyone what the Lord said to my heart. God is speaking. God wants to speak to us. And so, but the foundation of all this is a relationship with Jesus Christ. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's the foundation. That's the foundation. And everything I've spoken of is built on it. But if you don't have that, don't none of that other stuff work. And so I want to challenge us to do three things. Ask God to open your spiritual senses to hear him and to know him in a deeper and better way. To invite God into every area of our lives. Our spiritual life ain't no Sunday service. It's everywhere we go. It's homes, the movies, it's the basketball game. Don't mean you got to be jumping and shouting and preaching to people at a basketball game, but God wants to be involved in all parts of our lives. It's about relationship. Three, ask God to speak to you in dreams and in visions. Ask him. Ask him. And he'll do it. And lastly, when I went to South Florida Bible College for my first class, one of my first classes was business leadership. Brought in a speaker, and he told us something that shook the foundation of our work ethic. We live in a society that's always quick pace. Run, 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 run. Don't stop running until you can't run no more. And then after you can't run no more, get back up and run some more. He said something to us. He says, God told him with his business, grace over grind. Grace over grind. And it didn't mean don't work. Just you ain't called to hustle. You ain't called to be nonstop. You need to rest. You need to relax. And you need to trust me with this business. And you need to take vacations. And he told us something, and it shook all of us because it shook the foundation of, like, wow, we've been grinding. As believers, we've been grinding. God didn't call you to grind. He called you to grace, to do it with grace. And he said this, when he did that, the business went from making a million to making a billion. So when we follow God's mind, we can make more, we can do more, we can be more, and it's easier. Because when we do it from self-effort, it's always going to be frustrating. But when we do it from grace and God's perspective, 
We can prosper, we can win, we can have victory. Um, is there anyone here? You don't know God's thought for your life. You don't know God's mind for your life. And so God always has a picture of his life for us. Eight by ten picture frame. This is God's view. This is God's heart. This is God's dream for us. This is us. Sometimes we shrink God to our level. And what God really want to do is enlarge us and enlarge our thinking so we can think like him. Only way that happens is first, the foundation is Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And all the other things are just the walls, the tile, the roof, the bathroom. But Jesus Christ is the foundation. And if you don't have that, none of that other stuff work. Who here has God been pricking on your heart? Been pricking you all week, been pricking you all month, been pricking you all year, been pricking you all for the last decade. And he's pulling you to himself. Who here does not know Jesus Christ in the pardoning of their sins and does not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Is there anyone here? Is there anyone here? So that means that everybody here, that when you die, physically, you're going to heaven. You have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That is wonderful. Give yourselves a round of applause. Amen. Amen. But Paul said, we go from glory to glory, faith to faith. Who here wants more? I, I won't, I don't want no three by two blessing from God. I want everything God said. I want an eight by ten. You want an eight by ten, stand up or raise your hand. Some of y'all okay with two by three. It's okay. It's okay. They're not there yet. They're not there yet. They're okay with a two by three, a three by two. That's fine. We're not going to force it on you. But if you want an eight by ten and you want God's best, we're going to have to change some things. And so pray this prayer with me. Father God, Daddy, I come to you humbly as your child. Open up my mind. Open up my senses. Open up my thoughts. Remove any teaching, tradition, strategy, blueprint, idea, concept, seed, root, that is against the knowledge of God that hinders your word that cancels your blessings that cancels your progression in my life I submit to you speak to me in dreams in visions in encounters with the Holy Spirit take me higher in Jesus name give me a new wineskin according to your word give me a new thought process expand my thinking don't allow me to be rigid or inflexible in Jesus name I submit to your plan to your thought I don't have to understand it but I will submit to it and Satan I rebuke you I renounce you I cut you off. I divorce every seed, every thought, 
every plant you planted in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.